I know we just met, but I really have to come up and just lay something big and kind of personal on the table. Otherwise, I don't know if you'll fully understand my perspective on things. So, so is that okay? Can we start there? So I'm a nutritionist. But I don't really have any interest in food. Well, I don't have any interest in the math of nutrition. I don't want to know what you ate for dinner last night. And I really don't want to tell you how many calories were in it. I don't want to calculate how much protein that you need every day. And you will never, ever hear from me how much vitamin C is in an orange. Ever. But I really love what I do. I have the best job in the world. And I have such a great job because I really love a good puzzle. And our diet and what it does to the body when it's out of balance is an absolutely spectacular puzzle. About seven years ago, I started getting many clients with digestive issues. And those of you who are dealing with digestive issues will probably agree with me that digestion is an even better puzzle. Two people can come to me with exactly the same symptoms, but what is going on and what they need to feel better will be completely different. And that I just eat right up. I love it. A piece to the puzzle that I kept hearing from client after client was seemingly unrelated symptoms of, that were from their brain. They were feeling foggy, they were having trouble concentrating, and now they were dealing with depression, anxiety, mental health symptoms that they didn't have before. I thought that was odd. But then I looked backwards into my life, and I realized that when I had digestive issues, that was also the time that I felt foggy, had trouble concentrating, and was very depressed. So then I thought, did I just come across one of the most amazing coincidences in the world, or is there an actual connection? So I dove into the research, and what I found was an 100% yes, there is absolutely a connection from these very seemingly unrelated body symptoms, your gut and your brain. And what connects these two is our microbes, the bacteria that lives in our gut. This inner ecosystem, this amazing amount of bacteria actually outnumbers us cell to cell. We are 90% bacteria. What that means is that every cell that you have that's human, you have nine cells of bacteria. My favorite author, Michael Pollan, just calls us bac bacteria locomotion machines because that's really what we are. We're much more that than we are human. And this bacteria plays a big role in our overall health. It is intrinsically intertwined in our immune system and, and helps our immune system decide when to react and when not to react. It helps out our metabolism by deciding how much energy we're going to extract from the food that we eat. And it's very much connected to our brain. And the reason it's connected to our brain is that we actually have a large amount of brain cells of neurons living around it, our, our gut. This is called the enteric nervous system, and many people refer to it as the second brain because it is so elaborate. Digestion is really tough. We need a lot of energy and brain power to help us digest our food. Because it's so elaborate, it uses the same neurons or brain chemicals that our brain uses, and we actually make most of these neurons in our gut. We make 90% of our serotonin, our feel-good neurotransmitter, and 50% of our dopamine, our reward neurotransmitter, here in our gut. Its job here is to move food through our digestive system, and for a long time, we just thought that, th that those neurotransmitters just stayed put. Today, we don't know if they do. They may or they may not. But what we do know is that when there's an imbalance in neurotransmitters in our brain, that frequently means we have imbalance of neurotransmitters in our gut. Low levels of neurotransmitters in our brain is called depression. Low levels of neurotransmitters in our gut is called constipation and slow digestion, a depressed gut. An abundance of neurotransmitters in the brain is called anxiety, and an abundance of neurotransmitters in the gut is, creates cramping, pain, and diarrhea. 
frequently they go together. When you have one, you have the other. I've only found one or two circumstances where they haven't mirrored each other. It's really quite cool. Research dove in and wanted to see how much power does the bacteria have over the, the production of these neurotransmitters. So the researchers took mice and they, they kept them sterile. They didn't allow any bacteria in their body. And what they found was those sterile mice produced 60% less serotonin than their brothers next door that were full of bacteria. What's really, really cool is that when the bacteria was added back into those mice, those serotonin levels went right back up to normal. So that tells us two things. It means that our bacteria communicates with our intestinal wall and help ask for these neurotransmitters. And if our neurotransmitters are low, due to low amounts of bacteria, well, then we can fix that. That's really cool. But it doesn't end there. The bacteria in our gut may actually play a role in our behavior. A study out of Ohio State University looked at toddlers. And what they found is those toddlers with the most diverse gut bacteria, so this was a beautiful ecosystem like a rainforest with all these different strains and really lovely communities, those toddlers had the highest number of behavior, positive behavioral attributes, like being sociable and being curious. They also found certain strains of bacteria connected to extroversion in boys. And extroversion is being very outgoing. I'm the opposite. I'm an introvert. And this study made me think, wait a second, how much of my introversion is me, which I always just thought it was, and how much of that is my bacteria talking? And that we simply don't know yet. The research is really, really new. We're just on the cutting edge of understanding how much of a role our bacteria plays in our overall life. But what we do know is that diversity is what it really matters in our gut. What we need is an incredibly beautiful ecosystem with many different types of strains and many different communities. And this is where we get the best balance. The American Gut Project has looked at stool samples from thousands of North Americans and thousands of people around the world. Can you imagine that job? <laughs> And people say that I like to talk about poop a lot, like, come on. <laughs> so what they found was those people with the most diverse diet had the mo most diverse gut bacteria. So this is something we can do. We actually fully control the diet of our gut bacteria. It lives in our digestive system. If we don't eat a food, it doesn't eat it either. But the bacteria in our gut send signals to our brain and asks us what it wants. So when you have an imbalance of certain bacteria, you're going to be craving junk foods. When, when you have a ba different balance of bacteria, you can start craving more vegetables. It's really quite lovely. That's what I've at least seen anecdotally with my clients. What the American Gut Project did find was plant-based foods as king. The more fruits and vegetables we have in our diet, the more diverse our gut bacteria is. So while I'm not a conventional nutritionist, I am standing up here telling you to eat more fruits and vegetables. But I'm not just wagging my finger and telling you to do so, because we all know this. But I see what you eat, and I know we don't actually do this. So what, instead, I want to share a few tricks, some easy ways to create a more diverse diet, because real change actually happens with small, itty-bitty little steps. It doesn't happen by just tomorrow deciding, I'm not going to eat any food I like anymore, I'm just going to eat this plant stuff. No, that's not real. Instead, what we need to do is make slow little changes. The easiest way to incorporate more plant-based foods into your diet is simply shifting the way you look at each meal. We tend to put protein as king and decide, I'm going to have this protein for dinner. I'm going to have fish or chicken or steak or beans. And everything else is, is the support. Instead, flip that around. I'm going to have these vegetables for dinner. Everything else being its support. That alone, that simple shift in how you think, can change your diet enormously. Another thing you can do because we tend to get into really bad habits and eat the same foods over and over and over again, in North America, we have very low diversity in our gut bacteria because we have very low diversity in our diet. So a simple way to combat that is once a year, for about a month, 
buy a different fruit or vegetable you've never bought before once a week. That's it. That's four. That's four a year. Come on. We can try four new things a year. I've been doing this for four or five years, and I fi find that two a year stick. It doesn't seem like a lot, but I've been doing it for four or five years. So now I have 10 fruits and vegetables that weren't in my diet five years ago. This wasn't hard. This was easy. I don't even think about it. It's just how it is. It's really quite amazing. The other food our, our gut bacteria just love is fermented foods. And fermented foods is completely missing from our diet in North America. These are fermented vegetables like sauerkraut, or fermented soy like miso, or fermented teas like kombucha. The, these are getting more and more popular, but these are still foods that are lacking in our diet. And, and it's because we don't need them. We don't need to ferment foods to keep them for a long time, but our, our gut bacteria desperately needs them. Fermented foods is our gut bacteria's absolute favorite food. It's, it feeds the best bacteria in our gut and creates beautiful balance. They frequently contain bacteria and will seed the gut with new bacterias. But the coolest thing they do is those little bacterias that you add back into your gut educate your gut bacteria on how to digest. So it actually reduces your indigestion symptoms because there's an education going on. It's really quite neat. But it doesn't end there. There's one more thing that we can do with our diet to create balance in our neurotransmitters. And according to the research of Carol Hart, who, in her book, Secrets of Serotonin, she has found that breakfast, in particular, is very important in shifting our neurotransmitters or finding balance in those neurotransmitters. If you deal with low levels of neurotransmitters, so that would be depression or constipation, then having a very starchy breakfast can increase your serotonin levels by 10%. The type of starchy breakfast I'm talking about is full of fiber and nutrients, things like potatoes or sweet potatoes, root vegetables. It could be steel-cut oatmeal or quinoa. The key here is to have a starchy breakfast that is really well balanced with these nutrients and fiber. Those of you who are like me and, and are wired for depression know how lovely sweet foods are and how happy we feel when we eat them because they do the same thing. Those refined flours and the refined sugars will also bring our mood right, right up, but it's not very stable and they'll just crash our mood later. So we are just on this roller coaster. When we have a breakfast that's full of fiber and nutrients, that doesn't happen. But if you're dealing with the other side, if you, uh, if you frequently deal with anxiety, so you're dealing with anxiety or diarrhea, what we need to do is bring those neurotransmitters down. A high-protein breakfast can bring those neurotransmitters down by 35%. If, though, you are dealing with depression and you're having a high-protein breakfast, which is what's in style right now, we're all eating a high-protein breakfast right now, what that can do is bring your serotonin and dopamine levels down even further, but then frequently what I see with my clients is it triggers cravings later in the day. The body will try to balance itself out, and it's going to do that when your willpower is at its lowest, which is when? Evening. And now, instead of wanting something starchy and lovely, you want candy or chocolate or something really, really sweet. So finding the breakfast that works best for you can make a big, big difference. And I invite you to make some experiments with your diet and, and try different breakfasts and try different fruits and vegetables. Because the coolest thing about small, easy dietary changes is your body will thank you by making you feel a little bit, little bit better. And that makes these changes really, really easy. But by no means am I saying that simple dietary changes are the 100% solution for very complex issues like anxiety and depression. But I have seen how powerful our diet can be at taking the edge off these conditions and making our day-to-day -day activities a little bit more doable. I feel this is a really important part of self-care. And self-care is an important part of connection. Because when we take care of ourselves and we feel good and we have energy, then we have energy to reach out and help each other and connect with each other. Author, shame researcher, and very popular TED speaker, Brene Brown, tells us that human beings are wired for connection. And connection brings us joy and happiness. But a very common symptom of anxiety and depression is disconnection. 
Connection brings us together and creates a strong community. And this is how I want to ignite change in our community. This is something we all can do. Understanding how food makes us feel and taking an active part in feeding and fueling ourselves better can create change in our culture. It can, it can be a catalyst for change. By taking care of ourselves, we can reach out and take care of each other better. Thank you.